but we really are trying to use language to describe or explain or analyze something that is essentially visual in nature. So the elements right now that we are studying are part of the language, part of the word language that we can apply to the visual language of art forms, basically. I think one of the most difficult terms, elements to actually define in language is the next term that we're going to cover, which is space. We're gonna look at space in three dimensions first, and then we'll discuss the applications of space in two dimensions, okay? Um, space is al almost, it's so kind of indefinable and variable that it's it's very difficult to, to convey in words um, and even in pictures as well. Um, it's, it's such a relative experience. So we tend to experience space from the point of view of our own placement in relationship to it. So who we are, what do we see in, at the next level? Which objects, how far away is the next object? What does the next space look like, right? So it all comes back to how do I see this in relationship to how near or far it is away from me or to the left or to the right, above or below. So in the case of three-dimensional work or architecture, um, we're really thinking about all of those dimensions of space, not just looking through a picture plane the way that we would in a two-dimensional piece, but it's much more about the body in space that artists and architects are addressing. So to experience three-dimensional space, we have to be in it. And the field of architecture and interior design as well is specifically concerned with how people navigate and move through and experience the spaces they occupy. So the first work that we're looking at right now is the North Terminal at the Ronald Reagan Airport in, Was in Washington. Um, Cesar Pelli is the architect who designed this space. He talked about the idea that he wanted to create an experience that would feel less industrial and less about large machines and more personal, more about more relating to the way a person might experience their home space. So the light in this terminal, the fact that as you move through the, the longest passages of it, you're actually moving from one section into another that's that's market, demarcated by the domes that are over your head, um, starts to make it feel like you're passing from one interior to another, from one room to another. And so right in the concept for this building, is the intention to create an experience of a very industrial, mechanical, technological environment to add something of the intimacy of one's home to that. But because these windows are so tall and part of the experience of walking through is seeing all of the scenery around the airport, there's also this kind of um, engagement with the outside world when you are inside the building. So when is a window not just a window, right? Um, well, for an architect, it is a window, the shape of it, the amount of light that it lets in, the position that it faces, all of these things are really intellectual decisions that relate back to an overall concept for the space itself. Um, so we can think about the outside of the building as an enclosed space or a mass in space, right? And the interior as a volume that the viewer experiences as we move through it, okay? So what architects are engaged with is the qualities of that space and how it relates to the functions of the building and how that relates to what the function of the building means for the viewer as they move through it or how our movement through it plays a role in the purposes of the building as well. So we've already talked about this a little bit when we looked at the monument in the first um, in the first module, right? Okay, um, space in two dimensions, um, rather than having to move around it or through it the way we do with sculpture or architecture in order to get the full experience, with drawing and painting, we see the surface all at once, right? In drawing, prints, and photographs, and paintings, the actual space of each picture surface, the picture plane, it's defined by its edges, right? So it's usually the two dimensions of height and width. 
what we're looking at in the image on screen now is actually a fragment. So it's not formally a rectangle, but we can see a rectangle within it that works like a frame within the piece itself. Um, paintings and drawings traditionally have been done on surfaces like paper or canvas or wood panel that are rectangular in nature, although we'll see some exceptions to that as we move towards the 20th and 21st century later on in our time together, right? So the two dimensions of height and width. So within these boundaries, there's an, a great deal of possibilities of how to handle what we call pictorial space. Pictorial, the space of the picture, right? It can be, it is an implied space inherently. It's an illusion, right? Because the surface of the page is flat. The picture plane is flat. But if we begin to think of that as a window into a world, as is the case with some, with art forms, uh, with the Renaissance, right? Um, if we start to think of that as a window into an illusion of depth on that picture plane, then we can begin to examine some of the ways and some of the reasons why and when artists might choose to emphasize a real illusion of space, um, creating depth on the picture plane with various strategies and techniques that we'll cover. Okay, so in the painting, in the painting we're looking at now, this is an early Egyptian painting. It has very little depth, right? The objects are portrayed from a most identifiable angle. In other words, if the intention is to be able to see and understand the whole image of the silhouette, if it is about the image, the thing that is in the picture, right? In other words, my perspective and my point of view is not as important as understanding what these objects are here, right? So they're clearly communicated because of the way that they are depicted. Um, the wall painting is from the tomb of Nebamun, and it's a good example of clarity and emphasis that is placed on objects rather than the space. So we can see that the pool looks like we're looking at it from a bird's eye view, like we're actually flying over the pool and looking directly down at it. Um, the trees and the fish and the birds are all shown from the side. So it's a complete silhouette or shape that we see. Um, it avoids any confusion or a shift in focus away from the objects themselves that might be created by any kind of allusion to depth, like overlap or um, form in any way, right? So let's transition into the opposite circumstance where we do have some overlapping forms in this painting by Paul Cezanne, Still Life with Apples from the 1890s. Um, this is a painting that has uh, several different strategies at play in it to create this sort of implied depth, um, illusion of depth, right? The viewer may be conscious of a picture's actual flat surface and the illusion of depth at the same time. So it's calling attention to the fact that this is a painting, right? Artists can actually choose to either emphasize that aspect of the painting process. So when we look at the strokes in this painting, they're very directional. They tend to be contrasting. There's no attempt there to make them look like a realistic pattern or decoration of any kind. I'm looking at the ground where we see that little dark area of brushwork below the plate of the peaches and just underneath the last, the last apple in that plate. Um, I'm looking at that shape. It doesn't refer to anything. It doesn't describe an actual thing. It's just a mark. And so once I see and understand it as a mark, then I'm understanding that I'm looking at a painting and not an illusion of a plate of apples, not in the truest illusionistic sense. And let's say we have something to compare it to. So if we compare the relative, the relative realism of this painting to the Trompe l'oeil painting by William Harnett that we saw, the two that we've seen since we've begun, this is not that, right? This is a this is still representational in a sense, but there's more of a subjective take on things. It's less about being faithful to the illusion. Although space is obviously important to the artist here. And so some of the ways that we know that is because clearly there is what we might call the line between the end of the tabletop and the beginning of the background. We might refer to that as a horizon line. So 
anytime there is something like looking at the horizon in the distance, even if it's a shallow space, the way that it is in this painting, it still is a clue to the viewer that there is depth happening here, right? Because of our experience of the world, okay? So in addition to that, there is overlap. So these overlapping areas where the lemon is in front of the next fruit, in front of the next fruit, that overlap tells us that one thing is in front of another. So we immediately read space in that. Um, the lemon is lower on the picture. So that also, that low to high movement can also indicate depth in a design when it's interrelated with other things. Um, the verticality of the fruit too, right? So it's tall and we have one on top of another, one behind another. So there are these positions that indicate near and far, but also gravity. So that contributes to the illusion of form and depth as well. Okay, so it's really interesting though, that there is a certain amount of flatness in this image too. Um, the overall space with those patches of parallel brushstrokes, we talked about those a minute ago. We look at them again and try to understand the quality of depth that we're seeing there, if we're seeing at any at all, and if it reads like a consistent quality of depth all the way through the picture, or does it feel flat? So I think it may take a minute to understand that the space behind the tabletop is really not clear. It's not clear how far away it is. It's not clear how close the table is to whatever, if that's a painted wall. So there really, it's, there really is a kind of a, a shallowness or a, or a, um, a stopping of the energy of the overlap that the fruit is giving us, if that makes sense. So we're getting these closely related overlaps and then all of a sudden this flatness emerges. And so space becomes a little ambiguous or unclear and the brushstrokes only add to that because they break the illusion. So this sort of play with ambiguity of space is a really, really important uh, development that Cezanne initiated in has a huge impact on the art that's going to come after him. So we'll revisit it again in a later module. But to summarize right now, the, one of the things that we're learning from this little painting is various ways of depicting space, of implying depth in a painting. Uh, we've talked about scale relationships, so large to small, for example. We've also talked about position in space. And when we say position, we're thinking about placement really as a compositional choice. So the lemon in terms of its placement is lower on that 2D surface of the picture plane. And the fact that it's lower is a cue to us that it is nearer to us, as much as the overlap that we've been discussing is as well. I want you to take a quick look at the bottom left at that cup that's actually cropped out or the little planter, silver pewter looking texture. So it's actually cropped out of the image. Is it closer to, to us, the viewer, than the lemon is? What do you think? And if so, why? Right. A bit of placement play happening in this in this painting, I think. Um, anyway, we'll return to Cezanne in a little bit of a later module. But right now, what I want to do is talk about another system that is based on the way that we see things. This is a system that is about creating the implication of depth or the illusion of depth. And it's called linear perspective. This is a Western system that was invented in the 15th century in the Renaissance. Um, Brunelleschi is an architect who is widely credited with developing this system. Um, it's important to know that this is particularly Western and that other, other areas of the world, other systems of art making uh, will have a different way to create a sense of depth. And we'll look at a few of those in a bit. So this is specifically West Western. Um, so before we get into sort of looking at this, the applications of this system in some paintings, I want to just give you a, a little bit of an overview of the basic terminology that we're talking about. Okay, so it's based on the way that we see things. I've given you a few illustrations here in the slide that kind of help us to understand a few terms. So the first one that I want to look at is picture plane. So picture plane we've talked about, but hopefully this will help you make a connection between the window that is the actual view onto three-dimensional reality 
and the canvas, in the case of this illustration, that is the window onto the illusion of three-dimensionality, right? The three-dimensional world. So the picture plane as a real window onto the world is equated with the picture plane that is the surface of the drawing or the painting or the print, right? Depending on the intentions of the artist. And so in this case, we can see that the artist is seated and that the window is serving kind of like a grid in a way. The kind of structural sort of panes of the window, see how those become the grid of the canvas itself that he's drawing on, okay? So Im important sort of to understand that perspective really is about to the degree that is possible, accounting for the positions of things in space at a nearly mathematical level, right? Based on the way that we see, one of the simple, one of the basic principles is that changes in depth result in the appearance of changes in size, not the actual change, right? But the appearance of it. So again, it's about perception. So in the illustration top center where you see the hand and you ask yourself, when is a hand as big as an adult human being? When the hand is closer to us than the adult human being is. So we can start to see these sort of receding diagonal lines that are on the ground plane or what looks like the ground plane of that image. Um, and with each step further back into space, the figure becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. What that's not able to show us is that the distances also become closer and closer and closer and closer. That's another appearance that changes in perspective. So I might rephrase that and ask you to look at that picture again and just assume that all of those figures are adult human male, human beings of the same size and they're equally distant from each other. Okay, if we think of it that way, that in physical reality, they're the same distance apart from each other, but in the illustration, we actually see that distance becoming closer and closer, particularly with the two very tiny silhouettes that are way in the distance next to the thumb, okay? <laughs> okay, um, another key feature that is really important about linear perspective is the function of the eye level. So in the first illustration of picture plane, we see the artist is seated, right? And he has one view of that set of buildings that relates to the fact that he's seated. But in the next image, he's standing up. So we can see that his eye level is being illustrated here for how it relates to what he's seeing and how far away what he's seeing is below his eye level, above or below. Okay, so we're going to talk about that more um, for not only how it is related to the function of space in an image, but also for how it relates to meaning and the kind of experience that an artist wants the viewer to have. For now, let's take a look at the two types of perspective that we want to know about just at the very introductory level. One is one point perspective and the other is two point. So we want to talk about how that eye level is important, how it can change, and what's the difference between one point and two point perspective. So in the upper illustration, we're looking at A, B, and C illustrations here all the way to the right of your screen. The smallest, it, the image up at the top gives us that classic one point perspective view, which really means that everything, everything that is parallel in reality. So for example, we talked about the train tracks, parallel in reality, right? Here it's a road, two sides of the road are assumed to be parallel in reality, right? And the trees are parallel to that road and the, the whatever that architectural structure to the right is also parallel to the road, okay? So because they're all related in that way and they're all moving away from the viewer, right? The viewer is standing central to that vanishing point, okay? So everything that is receding back into space converges at that vanishing point, right? Which again is the viewer's position in space, okay? But notice that the vanishing point coexists with the horizon line, right? Okay. So in linear perspective, those two things, the eye level and the vanishing point where those two things converge is also the same thing as the horizon line, okay? And that's important because we can see when we look down at image B that whereas the top image feels like I might be standing, right? And looking all the way down the road, looking down the road, right? 
uh, in the next image, I'm actually a little bit lower, perhaps seated, right? So image B, notice how the eye level is lower, which within the frame of that rectangle allows the illustration to show what a box above and below the eye level looks like. Okay, so changes in eye level with a standing eye level, depending on how your photograph, your image is cropped, you might see a lot of land with just a little bit of sky. But in a seated position, you might see a lot of sky and a little bit of land. Imagine if you were a worm. So from a worm's eye view, little sliver of land and lots of sky, right? Versus a bird, right? So bird's eye view versus worm's eye view can be really helpful. All right, so just to illustrate then that it's our position in relationship to the vanishing point on the eye level slash horizon line is principle one, but two is also where the objects are relative to our physical body and to our eye level, right? So in illustration B, you can see the difference between still one point perspective, but the difference between a box that is above the eye level and slightly to this direction of the viewer, you can actually see three planes or three sides of the box. You can see the front plane, you can see the under plane because now it's above your eye level, but you can also see the side plane that is facing you, right? Facing the viewer, okay? Below the eye level, we might just see two planes there, right? So it's directly in front of us in this case. So we can see the top of that box and we can see the front of that box. And then to the left, we can see on the eye level, right? Almost exactly centered on the eye level, but to this direction, okay, to the left. We've got a front plane and a side plane only. So the appearance, the look of things can change, but the eye level stays consistent. And in this case, the single point perspective stays consistent in illustration B as well. So let's take a look then at the final one. The Everything stays the same here in illustration number C. We're looking at two point perspective. There's still an eye level. That eye level is still the horizon line. It is still based on where the viewer is positioned in space, right? This time what changes is the position of the form itself. So we're using just a simple box here. And notice if you look carefully at the difference between one point and two point, in one point, we're seeing a rectangle, the front of the box, it is parallel to the picture plane, right? So it's always gonna be the case in one point perspective that the front facing plane nearest to you is going to be either a rectangle or a square, right? When we're dealing with this simple form. But in two point perspective, all of a sudden we don't have this, right? The box that is facing us directly, but we're looking all of a sudden at a side side or a corner of the box. In other words, the corner is closest to us. And then we have one side going away back into space and another side going back into space, which gives us two vanishing points for those receding planes. So there's a lot of terminology here. We don't really need to get into the exactness of it. Um, it's a very mathematical system. There are perspectives to deal, perspective systems to deal with things that have really extreme viewpoints, and we're not going to get into that. But if you are interested in that, the book that I have actually borrowed these images from is an excellent introduction. Excellent, in my opinion, because while he clearly explains things in words, he also uses pictures really effectively and throughout. So this is Joseph D'Amelio's Perspective Drawing Handbook. It's no longer in print, but you can find it online and in Amazon. It's a Dover book, so it's very affordable and it's a great resource. All right, so now let's take a look at some applications of linear perspective. The school, Raphael's The School of Athens is a fresco that was painted in the Italian Renaissance. It was painted between 1509 and 1511 as a part of Raphael's commission to decorate the rooms now known as the Stanza di Raffaello in the Apostolic Palace of the Vatican. It depicts a congregation of philosophers and mathematicians and scientists from ancient Greece, including Plato and Aristotle, Pythagoras, Heraclitus, and Archimedes. So the painting notably features accurate perspective, right? A defining characteristic of the Renaissance era. Raphael learned perspective from Leonardo da Vinci, who incidentally is the actor playing Plato in this painting, in the center of the painting, really important. So some of the themes of this painting also reflect Renaissance ideals, such as the rebirth of ancient Greek philosophy and culture in Europe, 
Um, it was inspired by Leonardo's individual pursuits in theater, engineering, optics, or the way the eye sees things, geometry, physiology and anatomy, history, architecture, and art. We can see all of those aspects at play in this work, and it is widely considered one of Raphael's greatest works. It is certainly one of his best known works. Um, it is the masterpiece, it's been quoted, this is a quote, it has been described as Raphael's masterpiece and the perfect embodiment of the classical spirit of the Renaissance. So in this case, we want to understand both how perspective is being used as a system and how it shows up in the image. So if you look at the small illustration breaking the breakout of in the upper right section, we can see there's this convergence and how that convergence relates to the architecture of the space. And we can see where that vanishing point comes together at the eye level. So looking at that, we can understand just how far away the viewer is placed when looking upon this scene. And we can also understand, understand the eye level of the viewer as well. Okay. But visually speaking, Plato and Aristotle are the most important figures of the painting. And coincidentally, if you look at where these receding lines converge to a vanishing point, they converge to the point right at the two figures of Plato and Aristotle. So what we see here is an example of perspective being used to tell a story, to tell a story and to tell the viewer what the most important thing to see, what is the most important thing happening in this depicted moment, in this painted moment. There's so many things happening. Everybody's busy thinking and working and talking, right? So what is the most important thing to look at? It's those two great thinkers, Plato and Aristotle. So our converging lines and our vanishing point tell us that in a single point perspective, which is a very, it's a very, it has the potential to be a very fast movement through space, right? Because it leads us directly to one point. There's one point here and many different things that refer to that one point, okay? Um, so they are, the two figures of Aristotle and Plato are at the center of the painting there. And behind them is an archway, right? Which leads out to a vast and deep space. So just thinking about how that space creates a window onto something that is happening beyond the painting, and at the same time, how structural elements like the archway allows us to stop in time at the location of these two philosophers before we plunge out into deep space. It's a very important way of organizing the system there, right? So greatest stone of implied depth there. If we remove the figures then, as we see in the bottom right little breakout, the black and white version. So all of the architecture has been removed, right? And the figures have been dropped out down into the foreground. So they've been taken out of the architecture, pardon me. Um, so what we can see then is just how fast of a plunge back into space that single point perspective is. It's still in play in the black and white image, but without the figures to stop our vision, to even slow us down as they wind our way through space, right? We just shoot straight out of the back of that composition, okay? So without that grouping, that particular grouping that Raphael is using there, which is a compositional choice in addition to the perspective, right? Without that grouping, then we, the two figures become difficult to see at all. So to summarize, what we're seeing is that perspective not only gives us the sense of the vastness of the space, but it also puts us, the viewer, into the picture and as a storytelling device, it tells us where the artist wants us to look. Atmospheric perspective is another system of organizing space. Um, it's also known as aerial perspective. Um, uh, Leonardo da Vinci was credited with writing it down, right? Putting it down onto paper. But it is act as a system of, of um, space depiction. It goes back to 30 BC into some of the... Um, the murals of Pompeii, the frescoes of Pompeii. So it's very old, okay? All right, so in, in atmospheric perspective, it's not linear. What we see that are that changes in space are related to changes in contrast, color and detail, okay? And so how is it related to perception? In our perception, the changes that atmospheric perspective works with are changes in perception that happen because of the intervening atmosphere and the way light functions, okay? So in the visual experience of the real world, 
as distance increases between you, the viewer, and faraway objects, such as the mountains in this case, right? The increased quantity of air and moisture and dust causes the distant objects to appear increasingly blue and a little fuzzy, less distinct. So a basic principle of atmospheric perspective is that color intensity is diminished as things move further back into space, as well as the contrast between light and dark is also reduced, okay? So we want to be able to think about three zones in general when we're analyzing how this contrast changes. Foreground, middle ground, and background, general lands landscape kind of terminology as we look at this Asher Brown Duran painting Kindred Spirits. And in general, the closer things are to you, the more contrast there is between the elements. So we see dark trees, we see strong darks and lights alternating against each other on the barks of those trees, kind of wrapping up and over in front of the the cliff where the two, um, where the poet and the artist are standing. So more contrast in the foreground, as well as more detail. You can almost see each and every leaf, broken twigs on the ground plane, those kinds of things, right? Tell the difference between a fir tree and this birch tree, I think, with the white bark in the front. Okay, so detail is increased, but as we move back into space towards the middle ground, we can still see a suggestion or a differentiation between the trees and the mountains, but we don't have nearly the amount of detail, right? We can still see a little bit of color contrast, but it's very muted. In traditional Chinese landscape painting, artists had another way of creating atmospheric perspective. So we're still seeing qualities like overlap and contrast, but the illusion of depth is suggested in a different way. So the near and the distant mountains in Sen Zhu's painting are suggested by washes of ink and color on white paper. So we can see white clouds in front of dark mountains that are happening in the background. The, the light of the gray of the farthest mountain in the upper right starts to feel similar to the kind of atmosphere that we were looking at a moment ago. It has this atmosphere quality. But tr and traditional Chinese landscape paintings present poetic symbols of landforms rather than the realistic depictions that we were just looking at, right? So there's more of an emphasis in the Durand that we saw a minute ago. There's more of an emphasis on illusion of actual space than in this one, which has the textures, has the surface planes, has the qualities of different types of elements, right? Has atmosphere but they are much more symbolic of the location and the things in that location than they are about illusion, okay? So where kindred spirits draws the viewer's eye into and through this space, for sure. Um, poet on a mountaintop leads the eye across and allows us to wander through the landscape rather than deeper into space, okay? So we can even see this as the rise from, you know, from left in this white patch of foreground in the left through the mountains back in the other direction to the figure standing at the top and then down the slope again to the next tree to the next mountain. So there's much more of this sort of wandering back and forth through the landscape rather than an emphasis on how far away something is from us, okay? So we're really talking about how space, how the illusions of, of space that we physically walk through in the world around us or in sculpture or architecture, how there are techniques to recreate the illusion or the implication, implied space, right? So we also want to talk a little bit about time and motion as elements of art as well, art and design as well. And there are literally mediums like film and video, um, that we can talk about that, that that sort of fall explicitly into this category. But as we were talking about techniques the artist uses or abstractions that relate to space in a way, we're going to do the same thing in talking about time. Um, it, time is the fourth dimension. It is actually invisible, but it can be made perceptible or knowable in art. And a lot of traditions that are non-Western -West cultures will teach that time is a cycle a cycle, right, rather than a linear process. The Aztecs of ancient Mexico, for example, held that the earth was subject to periodic cycles of destruction and recreation, and their calendar stone embodies this idea. At the center of the stone, we see a face of a sun god that represents the present world, 
and he is surrounded by four rectangular compartments that each represent one previous incarnation of the world. The whole stone is round, and that symbolizes the circular nature of time. The Judeo tradition, uh, the Judeo Christian tradition of Western culture, teaches us that time is linear. So, in the painting by Sassetta, the meeting of Saint, Ath Saint Anthony and Saint Paul, we're going to talk about a few ways the composition and the the way the forms are working can suggest the experience of time. So the painting depicts key moments during St. Anthony's progression through time and space, uh, in, including his start at the journey of the city. He approaches the wilderness up in the top left corner. He encounters the centaur and then emerges into the clearing where he meets St. Paul. The road on which he travels implies a continuous forward movement in time. So we see stages of the journey happening on the road. The road psychologically is a passage through time, but experience, we also know the experience of moving from one place to another across a sidewalk or across a, word, across a road. So our ability and our memory of that experience of stepping from one stage of our life into another or from one place in our neighborhood to another. This painting is really taking that experience and emphasizing it symbolically through these episodes within the story of St. Anthony and St. Paul meeting, using the road as the interconnecting element there. Um, narrative sequence can also indicate time. So in a two-dimensional sense, the graphic novel or the comic um, is a, provides us a great opportunity to talk about how the passage of time is expressed in the way the frame, with, in the content of the frames, in the passage of the action as well. So this implied motion in Crazy Cat, right? Um, there's a there's a, those four panels in the in the middle where we see events starting to occur, realizations happening, um, and then a moment of aha that happens there, right? So as we read the frames from the top to bottom and the left of, to the right in this early strip, the main character Crazy Cat appears in a movie as a singer and is rewarded with a thrown brick. So there we have the story. We have the beginning of the story. We have the progress to get to that place. We have the performance, and then we have the brick coming in from somewhere off screen, right? And we know what's about to happen. So there's a narrative sequence there of an, a beginning, a middle, an end, and then a little bit of a secondary sort of denouement, if you will. Right. So comics, de, de, liter, in, in a narrative sense, comics actually deal with the passage of time much more explicitly, right? Time and motion, right? So the brick coming in was a frozen moment in the scene, in the drawing itself, but we read that as implied motion that's happening, okay? So we can think about that in an abstract sense too. So I think when we look at this um, Umberto Boccioni, Dynamism of a Cyclist, this is a futurist painting, the futurists were interested in this fracturing and this um, technological energy of all of these forces at work together. So when we look at this painting, I see a lot of movement. I see a lot of edges that circle and, and, and push and curve into each other. So there's a lot of interaction, almost like a mechanism is in motion and we're seeing the motion conveyed through the fragments and how they relate to each other. Um, speed and motion for the futurist was the most important subject. Um, I think even today though, we can look at the kinds of overlaps, the kinds of implied lines and shape relationships that are creating that swirling sense as a, as a, as a way to create liveliness in any work, um, even in three-dimensional experience, which we'll look at in a minute. So it's this relationship of all the moving parts, okay, that creates a sense of movement. But in the case of this painting by Boccioni, movement itself is the subject or the central quality of the subject of the painting, right? But we feel movement here too, right? In Jenny Holzer's um, piece in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the, in the Guggenheim Museum. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about this. This is really a wonderful use of implied motion. Um, so contemporary artist Jenny Holzer 
um, installed light boards on the inner edge of, a, of the spiral ramp of this museum in the Guggenheim Museum in New York. So we can actually see fragments of those phrases. So a sense of timing is the mark of genius, right? Attitude makes all the difference in the world. So those two things taken together tell us a little bit about the voice of the artist who created this. And then up above what it's like to be a mother, just a fragment of that phrase. So it's like all of these things are inner working, they're personal sayings, right, that she's using in a really clever way in this installation, because these places within the museum are traditionally used for advertising, right? So what she is advertising are her own personal slogans, not corporate slogans, but a woman who is a mother who is also an artist, personal slogans, right? They seem to kind of progress down the ramp in a continuous type of flow, but in reality, those lights go on and off at programmed intervals. So what we experience as a viewer is this spiraling effect and this constantly shifting slogans, right? And it's almost like we have to continually keep up with what we see and what we understand about what we see through this sort of really shifting experience of appearance and then disappearance and flashing and swirling, okay? So essentially it's about language and it's about being bombarded with language. And in Jenny Holzer's case, she's interested in design and mass media as an artist. And this piece speaks a lot about how mass media bombards us with input. All of the motion that's happening here. Look at the circular benches, the circles of the architecture of the Guggenheim, and then how she takes advantage of that movement movement that is inherent in the building and the, the, the literal purpose of where she's putting that text to tell her own story, to kind of sort of get underneath the surface of the way things are usually done and make us see it in a different way from her point of view. So we've talked a lot about implied motion, implied time, the illusions of those things and some ways that in depth as well, some ways that we can imply those things, but artists also make work that is that has to do with an interest in actual motion. So this type of art is called kinetic art, the incorporation of actual movement into the design. So before the advent of electric motors, artists created moving sculpture by harnessing the forces of wind and water. Fountains, kites, banners, and flags have all been popular since ancient times. Alexander Calder's marbles, such as the large work that we're looking at here in the National Gallery in Washington, DC, rely on air movement to, to perform their subtly shifting, subtle dances. Um, as viewers enter and leave the galleries of the East Building, the sculpture slowly moves in space. So Calder is one of the leading inventors of kinetic art or art that moves. He was one of the first 20th century artists who made actual motion a major feature of their art. And it's really wonderful because we're, we haven't talked about color yet, we will. It's not just the body moving through space, the doors opening and closing that creates that sense of movement. There's also a progression of the shape of the forms. They almost feel like bird forms or kite forms and also color changes, right? So as we move from these darker blackish shapes through blue, through orange, through red, that takes part in the other types of actual motion that are happening as well. So again, all the elements are working together to um, contribute to the experience of this form as a whole. I would say open form as well too, right? Because the space and the way it is engaged by the movement of the mobile is important. So one of my favorite aspects um, of uh, elements of art as an artist is the quality of light and it, all of its expressive potential. Everything that we see is made by visible light. Light can be directed, it can be reflected, it can be refracted, it can be diffuse. Right? All of those qualities, all of those atmospheric qualities, angles and directions have so much potential to create a narrative experience or to create a mood for a viewer, they can greatly affect the way things appear. So we're looking at the same sculpture under two different lighting conditions here, photographed under two different lighting conditions. Look at how much the light from below raises the eyebrows of Abraham Lincoln, right? It's almost as if he's shocked and bemused by being hit in the face with this light, right? The face appears wider, less gaunt, 
less skinny, right? Feels more full because the light is filling all of the, all of the surfaces that are actually hollow and making them appear rounder, right? So we haven't changed the form of the sculpture at all. It's the very same sculpture in the next version where the light is coming from above and to the left of the head sorry, to the right of the head, my left, your right, right? His right, <laughs> okay? So from high and from above and in between the viewer and the object and coming down onto the surface, the top planes of the surface of the face here, right? So we see the hair getting hit by the light and then casting a shadow, the brow ridge getting hit by the light and then casting shadows under the eyes. And all of a sudden those shocked eyes look like they are really fixed and intense on something ahead of them, right? So rather than being surprised by what he's just been, what he's just heard or seen, he's now really fixed and focused and concentrated on it. Okay. He's even got a little bit more of a disapproving look in the mouth. He's certainly much more gaunt and thin than he is in the first image. So the power of light to greatly affect thing, the way we see things and experience things. We're gonna talk about that some more. Um, what we were what we were actually seeing was a white object that had areas of dark and light that were affected by the angle of the light, whether above or below, right? So we talk about we call the term for those areas is called value areas. So in the terminology of art, value, which can also be called tone, is the relative lightness or darkness of any surface. So the bust that we were looking at in the photographs of Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln, excuse me, are white, as are the objects in the drawings that we're now looking at. Value ranges from white through various grays to black. One of the classic exercises that we do with students in our color design class is just to be able to create gradual increments of a change from white to black with a series of grays in between. So in the image that we're looking at now, we're looking at what's called a value scale. So what appears to be the background light on the on this side of the screen and then dark going in this direction, right? Okay, so we're seeing that gradual fade. That's a gradation, a gradation on the scale from white to black. We could also look at really distinct steps that evenly progress out of white into dark, and that would be a scale, okay? So gradation or scale, it just depends on how clear the increments are, okay? The subtle relationships between light and dark tones determine how things look. To suggest the way light reveals forms, artists use changes in value. So the two drawings that we're looking at of the cones on top of the, um, the hexagonal volume or the sphere, those things have a very three-dimensional look, right? So a gradual shift from light to dark can give the illusion of a curving surface, while very strong changes in value usually indicate a stronger change in the planes of the surface. So we talked about the brow ridge of Abraham Lincoln with the light from the top and how sharp that line was compared to the shadowing of the eyes. So the eyes push back into space from the head and that's a deeper cut. So if light is hitting here as something really moves back and away from that plane, it's gonna go into shadow. So let's take a look at these two drawings and just kind of take a minute. They're the same objects, right? The quality of light is a little bit different in both of them. And it's kind of subtle. So I just want you to take a minute and look at them and ask yourself about this change in value from light to dark. What is it that's different from the one on the top and the one on the bottom? Maybe one way to start to see that is to ask yourself which one feels more rounded, more rounded. So I'd say just take a look, even just taking a look at the cones, right? Cone on the top feels like it has strong light and it has nice roundness in the shadow, but the sense of roundness from light into the shadow is really not nearly as defined by value changes as the lower drawing is, right? So we see much more of a gradation of grays happening in the light side of that cone. And so the form is turning a little bit more because of that very gradual, progression of value away from the angle of light, okay? So a progression of value, a change from lighter to darker, okay? 
I want you to look at the hexagonal volume now, the one that has these planar sides and facets to it. Look at how the edges for every change in the edge. So we're looking at a top plane, a next side plane, and then an under plane that's in shadow in both cases, right? So if you look at the line or the edge that occurs where those two planes change, see how strong that edge is compared to any of the value changes on either the cone or the sphere. So that's the difference that we're pointing to here, whether it's a gradual change or a strong change. The look of the way the value changes is going to relate to what's literally happening on the surface of the object itself, okay? So chiaroscuro, chiaroscuro, it's a beautiful word. Chiaro meaning light, oscuro meaning dark. Um, it's literally a technique of using dark and light values to create the illusion of light or implied light. So in this painting, uh, sorry, in this in this black chalk drawing, uh, Francois Bonvin is it's a self-portrait, and he actually challenged himself to draw in a dark room with only one light source. So we really only see, again, that light that's high and to the side of the face and coming in and lighting those planes, right, that are closest to it. And then look where right here on this the, the opposite, the less light side of the face, where it starts going into shadow, right? So we have this strong sense of a direction of the light there. Strong light, strong dark, but then also a subtle shifting as the form turns. Creates the illusion that the figure is solid, that it has roundness and that it has bulk. I think one of my favorite parts of this drawing is actually the shirt where we see the buttons on the jacket and the folds of the collar happening. There are really only two values there, y'all. So the light is hitting much more strongly right here in the area of the most interest in this drawing, which is the face. We're drawn to the face and it's a natural focal area or area of interest in that way. But the light still feels like it continues to sort of diffuse through the rest of the drawing in the way we can see subtle light and subtle shadows happening weaker than are on the face, but still occurring in relationship to that light source on his jacket. It's quite beautiful, right? So chiaroscuro, light, dark. Um, we'll look at this again when we come back to looking at Renaissance artwork. Light can be a medium as well. Some artists use artificial light as their medium. Um, I want to talk to you about Keith Sonnier, who is the breakout artist in your textbook for this chapter. Please be sure to read that, y'all. He's from Louisiana. He's from Mamou, Louisiana. His family was Cajun and Roman Catholic. His father was a hardware store owner, um, and his mother was a florist and a singer. Sonnier was one of the first artists to use light sculpture in the 1960s. So this is very much a contemporary art moment. Um, he began experimenting with neon in 1968, and neon lights became a signature material that are used in his sculptural installations. So the common materials that he used were neon and fluorescent lights, as well as reflective materials like aluminum or copper and glass and also wires. So the interaction of those reflective surfaces and the colored light together really gives this intense play of the colors of the light. Um, he used these intense colors when he made this array in the outdoor li lobby of a government building in Los Angeles. He called the work motordom to express the reality of car culture that Southern Californians live with. I went to school in California. When I look at this image, the first thing I think about is seeing the freeways from above at night with racing cars going by, right? So we see this motion that's created by not only the lines, again, there's a little bit of that convergence happening, especially in this photograph, but also the alternating colors, the way you know the colors change as they move back into space, um, that creates a kind of motion, right? Um, so that motion is suggestive of the car culture. And it's really appropriate for this building because this is a building um, for the Caltrans Authority, which is the transit authority in California. So they run and they clean all the freeways and all the transport systems as well. So it's a public art piece in that way, which is great. Um, the neon tubes actually flicker in a pattern that repeats every five minutes. 
So it's as if the tall lights are passing along the sides and walls around the lobby. So again, like if you think about sitting in your living room at night and a car goes by and perhaps some of the headlights come in and cut across. So you see a little bit of their reflection on your wall. That's a similar variation of the idea that Sonia is really making a dramatic experience out of here. Okay? So because the light seems to shape that whole space, right? So it lines the walls and the wall that we're looking at. The volume that viewers perceive is very sculptural. So we do more than just look at the beauty or the motion or the shifting quality of the way the lights themselves behave. We actually enter the work. We enter the work. Okay? So it's sculptural as well as light-driven idea. Okay. Okay. So we're going to take a little bit of a pause here. This is a little bit of a longer segment. Um, and I'm going to give you just a couple of questions. Of all the examples of artworks where light is an important part of the work, either in this lect lecture or from the textbook, right? Or um, any other source where you might choose a different artwork than ones that I have discussed here for you, which is your favorite and why? Which is your favorite is why and why? So I think when you do, when you answer this question, part of the conversation should be to just describe the object and how the artist is using light in the work. So we're starting to apply some of the terminology that we've been learning about in these modules up to this point to our own personal interpretation of another artwork that we're interested in. Start with something that you're interested in. So you can ask yourself, for example, does the artist use different values of light or the technique of chiaroscuro to either suggest volume or express emotion? Right? We, didn't we didn't talk about emotion relation in relationship to the self-portrait that we looked at, but we did when we talked about the Abraham Lincoln photographs, right? So from the focused intensity to the surprise, okay? So does light participate in that somehow and why? Um, you might look at the works of Paula Mendelssohn Baker in your textbook, of Doug Wheeler, Asher Brown Duran, Francois Bonvin, Paul Chen, and Keith Sonier. So I'm going to leave you with that, y'all, and we'll be back again for the next module where we'll start our investigation of color.